Well, my my clock says that it's six thirty, and I know that um, there may be some who are on Facebook that want to go to a in person meeting. So, in order to use our time well and to com conclude timely, I'm going to suggest we go ahead and begin. Sounds good to me. All right, so let's let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful that we've shared time together for the last couple of months to have the opportunity to think about eternal principles, to guide our spiritual lives, to guide and give us insights, to think about outreach into our communities, into our world. We pray, Father, that we might not only be changed mentally, but that we might be changed practically, that our lives may be different and that we might be your effective servants. Bless our study tonight. Thank you again for the time we've spent. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what a privilege it's been to uh, share together this time, a very, very interesting time that we've spent together in all of this. And uh, so we're going to come this evening to the book of Galatians chapter six, specifically, uh, there's our, uh, I guess we could call it a logo, Galatians, a mission manual. Uh, I'm not certain what advantage or what benefit you feel you've received, perhaps uh, a rethinking of mission, a rethinking of how mission was done in the first century, what mattered, priorities, uh, perhaps simply to say, well, I have a different handle or a renewed handle on the book of Galatians, or maybe just in some practical ways, thinking about the relationship between Galatians and Romans, thinking about the role of the Old Testament, the New Testament, it would, it would be worth thinking that we have a, uh, an increased understanding of the Holy Spirit, because there are a number of references in the book of Galatians to the Holy Spirit. I thought we might begin this evening by taking one last look over our shoulders uh, and uh, think about um, what uh, we have accomplished, where we've been, what we've seen. Thinking about the historical setting, we are reading a book that Paul wrote, most likely thinking about the general consensus that Paul wrote shortly after his first missionary journey probably addressed to the churches that had been established in Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 14. If we were to think about larger themes, we would note that Paul throughout this book is very concerned with the purity of the gospel. And we can learn a great deal about the gospel thinking about how Paul defines pure gospel. Our contemporary world tends to put a focus on sound doctrine. It's interesting how seldom we hear the phrase pure gospel, and yet that's what Paul is concerned about. He's concerned about the Galatians. He's concerned about who's doing the teaching in his absence, and especially about the fact that there are some people that we describe as Judaizing teachers. That is, they're trying to keep one foot in the world of Judaism and one foot in Christianity. In chapter six tonight, we're going to have a chance to talk very specifically about what that might, might have looked like, what that might feel like. Paul begins autobiographically with uh, recounting his reception of the gospel, his knowledge of the gospel was received directly by revelation. His ministry and gospel were confirmed by the leaders in Jerusalem, chapter 2. And Paul sets forth again his commitment to the truth of the gospel, how that the gospel is that which gives honor and glory to the cross of Jesus Christ. Thinking about missions, we've talked about the three possibilities, the too hard, too soft, and just right gospel. Thinking about the, the beds in the Goldilocks story. Or we could call those legalism, the too hard gospel, license, the too easy gospel, and liberty. It's interesting that Paul uses liberty to describe the just right gospel. 
because I suspect if you were to do a poll in our contemporary churches that, and you were to say, give me one word that describes the gospel, liberty would not be one of the uh, responses that received good support. Now, if you gave them a list and said, choose one of these, it might come up a little bit, but I think we don't think about the gospel that way. So the questions that we could think about, and these are just thought questions. I'm not going, if you want to respond, you certainly can. Uh, always happy to receive communication, comments, questions. But the question to me is, how should this book inform how we do missions? And specifically, the message we take. Uh, do we take the good news of Jesus or do we take a system that has already been developed? And do we try to communicate with other people the system? Nothing wrong with systematic teaching. But at some point, I think people are helped by developing their own understandings and not simply uh, adopting a system that's presented. Obviously, there's a contrast between faith and law or between law and promise. We've talked about those things. We need not review them unless there's a question. God's agreement with Abraham, the promise, stands firm. And so Paul describes the law. We could, this is not a word he uses, it's my word, but he just, I, I think we could describe it as a bridge that moves us from the time of Abraham and the promise through Old Testament history until the coming of the promised seed. The difficulty is that the law imprisoned. It simply defined sin. The problem with the law was it had as its purpose to define sin. And the law says you have to do certain things, and if you don't do certain things, the law has no remedy. The law has no remedy for making that correct. So the law imprisoned, but Paul says it led us to Christ. So we are justified by faith, and we're sons of God and heirs, no longer slaves, and that is evidenced by the Spirit within us. So this section was characterized by a lot of concerns, a lot of warnings, Paul's contrast of the two hard hybrid gospels with a foot in Judaism and a foot in Christianity with the just right gospel. So here, this just right gospel is the gospel of freedom, freedom in Christ. And the danger is that if we return to a legal system, Christ becomes of no value. He says something like that at the end of chapter two, but there are unmanageable commands and obligations. At the beginning of chapter five that Tim led us in that study previously, cut off from Christ, distanced from grace. Who has cut you off? Very interesting constructions in the beginning of chapter five. He says, who cut in on you? And he says that after he says, you've been cut off from Christ. And then he speaks later on about the fact that the teachers, the Judaizing teachers, really did not have a desire to include the Galatians. They actually were also drawing lines of separation. So the call to freedom is not a call to license, and what, what makes that possible is the Holy Spirit. I don't know how it would be possible to give too much emphasis to this point. I, I think we miss this point many times. Uh, one of the primary purposes of the Holy Spirit is to guide us accurately and adequately in our understandings of freedom so that freedom does not become license and uh, as paul mentions and as tim focused last week the only thing that counts is faith that expresses itself through love chapter five and verse six so again some questions before we move to chapter six thinking about mission work <coughs> excuse me how important is the Holy Spirit in our mission work? I think that would be a question that would help us significantly. 
uh, living by the Holy Spirit keeps one from sin. And the Holy Spirit is set in contrast to being led by the law. And then we concluded last week with that wonderful picture of Carpos, the fruit, uh, who out of the mythology uh, was the result of the wind and the soil. So we have the, the zephyr, which uh, the wind, we think about spirit, uh, we think about fertile soil, and the spirit in the lives of people uh, who have fertile hearts, good hearts, brings forth not only fruit, not only the fruit of the spirit, but also extraordinary fruit coming to the end of chapter five. So we belong to Christ and those who belong to Christ keep in step with the spirit. I have what I described as a Christian cadence in my comments. So we come to chapter six. Any, any questions or thoughts or summary ideas that anyone would like to share uh, in chapters one through five before we come to chapter six? Anything by way of, of summary that perhaps I overlooked in this final look over our shoulders? Great summary, Bob. Thank you, Tim. Let's come and look at chapter six. If I were to try to summarize with a single theme or some kind of general topic, it seems to me that Paul concludes with a call to mutuality. He says, we're in this together. And if anyone is trying to cut you off, if anyone is trying to coerce you, if anyone is not interested in, in your well-being, if anyone's not trying to advance your knowledge of Jesus Christ, there are a lot of ways we could say that, reflecting the thoughts of Galatians 1 through 5. There, there has to be a mutuality. Uh, we are in this together. Uh, it, it has to be practical, but we have to understand the, the necessity of reciprocity. So here's the text, if we could read it together. Uh, he says this, brothers, if a person is overtaken in some transgression, that word overtaken literally means surprised. So he's, a person is overtaken, uh, a, a brother or sister in Christ. Um, I said person, the original word is anthropos, man, but it refers to both men and women. So if a person is surprised, but they know that they're in some difficulty. This is the sidestep that we've talked about previously. It's not really the word sin, so it, that may give the idea that it's somewhat accidental. Maybe that's to be understood from being overtaken or being surprised. You who are spiritual should restore such a person. Now, spiritual, for us, it's easy to lose the connection. Isn't it interesting that Paul's just spent a number of verses talking about the spirit. So what impact does the spirit have in our life? Well, one impact the spirit has is, is described in chapter six, verse one. It's interesting to me how many times we study the spirit and miss some of the verses that say the most about the spirit. It is the spirit that causes us to be concerned one for another. You who are spiritual, restore such a person. In a spirit of gentleness, watching yourself, lest you be tempted. Now, the temptation might be to participate in the same sin. But in the context, the temptation may be to become proud and to look down our nose at such a person who's struggling with something. Chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That thought appears more than once in the New Testament. Fulfilling the law of Christ by helping one another. Mutuality. Bear one another's burdens. We have the same word in verse 5, which I've translated carry his own backpack. Two different words. One of them is the heavy weight that goes on the donkey or the pack animal. The other is simply a, a backpack. It's, it's your own, it's a soldier's pack. It's your own love. 
both of them have to be born. In one case, we need help sometimes. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. This word will come up again, this idea of being deceived. Verse 7, do not be led astray. This is our word planet, which simply means wanderer. And so led astray is a good translation, but deceived is the word we know better. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Each should examine his own work and then within himself have reason for boasting. <clears throat> we don't find our cause for boasting by looking at ourselves in comparison to others. Verse 5, we've mentioned each should carry his own backpack, his own load. But two different words for load or two different words for burden. Verse 6, mutuality. I see these constructed somewhat like this. I, I see perhaps a little bit of a, a, a reflective construction so that the mutual responsibility of the first couple of verses is offset by our priorities to one another, especially those of the household of faith. And then we have the reference to burdens and packs. And we have principles so that we don't give up, so we don't become overburdened, so that we don't become tired. And then the mutuality of avoiding comparisons and sharing the message. Uh, that may not be what Paul had in mind, but it's one way to grasp six major ideas that appear in these 10 verses. So continuing, verse 6, let the one being instructed in the word share all good things with the one who instructs him. There's mutuality, both the one being instructed and the one instructing. Do not be deceived. Do not be led astray. God is not deceived. God is not made fun of. God is not mocked. And the contrast has to do with sowing and reaping, and there are two options either so to fleshly concerns or so to spiritual concerns. So to the flesh or so to the spirit. Sowing to the flesh or to, we could say worldly values, to a worldly point of view, brings us only to corruption. And that is we're dealing with things that are not eternal. Sowing to the spirit reaps eternal life. In all of this doing good, he says, we should not lose heart, for at the right time, we will reap if we do not quit. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are part of the family of faith. So there we have an expanded reading with some comments along the way. We have a responsibility to one another. Why do we have that responsibility? Because we are people who walk by the Spirit. Because we belong to Christ. Because we desire to be productive. Because the wind of the Spirit blowing across our heart keeps us in step with the Spirit. So we're doing the things that the Spirit is designed to do. To comfort, to encourage, to beseech, to urge. Those are possible synonyms for the word comfort. That word parakaleo, the paraclete, we may know that word. It's hard to translate that. Does that mean comfort? Does that mean encourage? Does that mean uh, beseech or urge? There are various ways to translate that word, the encourager, the comforter, the beseecher. And of course, eventually in 1 John 2, the one who walks alongside us. Uh, the one who is our attorney is actually the word that's used in 1 John 2, 2, the one who is our advocate. That's the very common, that's the same word. So the Holy Spirit is our advocate, our comforter, our encourager, our beseecher, and we are to be that. We are to be that to one another. That's what he's saying in chapter 6 and verse 1. That's our mutual responsibility because we're spirit-led people. When someone says that they're very much in tune with the Spirit and they care not about other people and care not about brothers and sisters in Christ, this verse gives us cause for pause. We can at least think and analyze and ask a question. 
We have mutual responsibilities in helping one another. We get burdens that are too heavy for us. That's the nature of life. When someone has a burden that's too heavy, what are we to do? <laughs> We're to help them. We're not to become codependent with them. We ought not to be helping them carry burdens that are their responsibility. That's an important part of parenting. I think a lot of parents have a tendency to want to uh, bear the backpacks of their children when their children need to be bearing their own backpacks, spiritually, I'm thinking. So we don't want to compare ourselves with others <clears throat> to make ourselves look good. We share mutually. And these are the principles. How do we sow? How do we reap? The priorities, especially for one another. So thinking about, uh, well, let's just go ahead and keep that there and and see if there's any comment about the first 10 verses. I've got the song, Bless Be the Tie, running through my brain. Hmm. It seems like they- Well, my song, my song to deal with this would be how sweet, how heavenly yeah. is the sight. Uh, when those that love the Lord, that, that, that to me just, the, the five verses of that song pretty much say it all. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. We, we have responsibilities each to the other. Uh, excellent. Other comments, other thoughts? Well, let's look at the rest of the text. It's not a long chapter, 18 verses. We're coming to the end. We'll have an opportunity after we deal with this section to kind of conclude the book and do some takeaways from the chapter and some takeaways from the study. Uh, the entirety of the book, and then we'll be done for the seat. See what big letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. As many as want to make a good showing in the flesh, these are compelling you to be circumcised, only so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. But these being circumcised themselves do not keep the law, but they want you to be circumcised, so they can boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision is anything nor uncircumcision, only a new creation matters. Upon all who conform to this standard, peace be to them and mercy, even to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So Paul apparently takes pen in hand, as is mentioned in other of his letters. He writes, it's kind of like making, kind of like putting his signature on it, although he does more than sign it. He says that those who are trying to compel you to be circumcised are, are wanting to make a show of it. And the point is that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Now, I think what he's saying is this. There are some Jewish Christians who are a significant part of a Jewish community in the Galatian area. And the way that they maintain their status in the Jewish community is to kind of keep their Christianity a little bit under wraps and continue to pretend as though they're fully committed to Judaism. Because if they don't continue with a fairly full commitment to Judaism, they'll be persecuted, perhaps excluded from commerce, from business transactions. So not sure what the level of persecution might be, but, but these Judaizing teachers are just people. They're just people who are trying to balance life. But the impact on what I read is Gentile Christians who are coming to Christ and the Jewish teachers with Jewish backgrounds wanting to make a show of their commitment to Judaism, to show the Jews who are not Christians how committed they still are to Judaism. That seems to me to be something of the flavor of what's going on here. They want you to be circumcised, but they themselves are circumcised and they don't keep the law. That's what he says in verse 13. 
So this is just a matter of boasting. This is not a matter of actually urging you to keep the law. They're not even doing that. They just want to, they just want to be able to boast about their commitment to Judaism. I think that's what we should be reading about their boasting. Paul says that kind of boasting is, is a thing of the past. Here's the cause for boasting, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the crucifixion. Let us think back in crucifixion, chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Circumcision and uncircumcision, those are not the things that matter. A new creation. And then notice what he says in verse 16, upon all who conform to this standard, peace, mercy, he calls them the Israel of God. If you want to know who the true Jews are, if you want to know who's really conforming to God's plan, this reminds me of Romans chapters 9 through 11, when we have not all Israel is Israel. We have a little difficulty sometimes identifying what's Paul talking about when he talks about Israel. Well, here he's saying that these Gentile Christians, when they conform to this standard with peace and mercy, that they, they are the Israel of God. They become participants in the Israel of God. Paul would like to escape these concerns and this difficulty, let no one cause me trouble. He's already been persecuted. Not certain what specifically he's thinking about there when he talks about having borne in his body the marks or the scars uh, of Jesus. Um, that's, that's a bit unclear as we think about our timing, what had occurred uh, in his life. You know, when is he writing this? Has he already gone by those churches? Is he in Philippi uh, having been put in prison? exactly what the reference might be is not easy to find and then a very typical closing the grace of our lord jesus christ be with your spirit and it is a the you is plural it's interesting a you plural but a singular spirit so, and so perhaps he's talking about their attitude perhaps just a very we do that kind of thing of mismatching pronouns and subjects uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. And of course, that would include both brothers and sisters. So we come to the end of chapter six, and uh, we follow the pattern we followed throughout these studies. Uh, both Tim and I like this idea of takeaways. So here are some questions for us to consider. What does mutuality look like in the contemporary church? the church today? What would be some evidences that we've caught on, that we've applied uh, this principle of practical mutuality, that we're caring for one another, we're watching out for one another, restoring one another? What would that look like in the contemporary church? Do we do it? Well, uh, let me get, <laughs> if we... <laughs> If we truly have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, how can we not do that? Because you've, uh, you've just said he's the comforter. He's the, he cares. <laughs> he loves the church. So his heart should beat in our heart to some extent. And we should, and I think sometimes it can, our hearts can beat a lot sometimes for uh, the troubles of others and the problems and the discomforts and the poverties and just the, all the problems you find yourself. Um, for, for all almost, people, but especially those of the household of faith. Yeah. Well, sometimes you find yourself almost burdened for, for the um, individual as they are uh bearing that right and and um who else puts that in our heart except christ and you know it's he's totally different <laughs> well, well thinking about that application in the contemporary church so here here we have new christians either new christians in our own churches or new christians in mission work and they don't get that so 
they've not totally bought into mutuality in most cases. They have to be trained. They have to, and they're trained by receiving. And they're probably going to be receivers before they're givers. So how, how can we encourage mutuality either among new Christians in our churches or in mission work so that they begin to, to get the flavor of what we're talking about when we talk about sharing the Christian walk in this way? Any practical ideas? Well, there again, <laughs> I, I will add maybe a little bit of a personal note. When you were speaking about the Venezuelan Sunday, that <laughs> was the very tall man was, you know, right. not all right. That those things really speak to you. And I normally that would just pass over you. So who is speaking that? That is Christ touching our heart that someone is living like this. And so we began to think how we may help that person or that group of people. I've thought of that man all week. He has, he has been with me the entire week. And I think there's something the Lord's going to work out in that, but I'm waiting on it. But um, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter about our distances. It's sometimes we have too much distance in our heart and Christ, maybe. But as he, he's a tremendous influence to woo us, to I, I care and love for someone we've never seen. Yes. It's, I had a very interesting experience today. I'm, I'm going to share this as we think about mutuality. So for some reason this morning, uh, as I woke up, I was thinking about a couple I know. Uh, he is a graduate of Baxter Institute. They live in Holland. Uh, they're working with Spanish speakers in Holland, and his wife is from Holland. Um, they, they met in Honduras, but they have returned to her home country. They're working with the church, and for some reason this morning when I woke up, they were on my mind, and I haven't heard from them or from their family probably for six months or so uh, about their status. Well, a couple of hours later, early this morning, his mother wrote me and said, by the way, Anthony had surgery yesterday. And Diana is pregnant and there's some risk involved. She's to deliver next month. And she said, could you pray for them? And I said, well, very interestingly, I already have today, uh, but I didn't know that I didn't know that you were going to write me and ask me to pray for them. Uh, and you, you wonder sometimes where that comes from as you, as you have hearts of concern and all of the people that we know and the people who struggle in so many different kinds of uh, situations. Other comments, other thoughts? Let's when I think this about verse. This, Go ahead. When I think about uh, how mutu what mutuality should look like and I think about chapter six, you know, the, the two big things that, in, that we historically, at least I historically take away is the idea of the spirit of gentleness and restoration uh, that it describes, you know, uh, which is counterintuitive uh, in, in conflict resolution. Um, so, you know, it's, it's being a gentle. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the notion that we... Uh, Look for opportunities to do good for, for others, especially those that are part of the household of faith, that idea. And, um, you know, at the risk of it sounding in, in, uh, internally focused, I think, think maybe one area where we take, uh, 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 and we think about new Christians, your next question there, uh, we, we, we create a culture and environment where those opportunities are there for, for us to do good uh, for those in the household of faith understanding that we that's that that's not a missions manual thing but it maybe it's it spurs us on to that and uh, the other thing i like uh, from ch chapter 6 and verse 15 this idea that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matter just to uh, being a new creation or a new creature i forget how i put it and that takes me back to chapter 5 and verse 6 when it's faith expressing itself through love 
uh, and this idea of uh, carpos uh, being fruit. And so what mutuality looks like is it, 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 this, it's a matter of identity. Uh, this, uh, and I think of the song, Something Beautiful, uh, that, uh, that God makes out of our lives. Uh, that's what, that's uh, when we allow his spirit to work on our hearts and uh, we submit to it, uh, then, then uh, uh, not only is it manifested in doing good for the household of faith, not only is it manifested in gentleness, but it's manifested just in our identity uh, as we're this new creature, this new creation. I, I have found that new Christians, when they become new creation, they want opportunities for service. I think sometimes we don't challenge new Christians enough. Right. Uh, to be generous and participating and to immediately buy into mutuality. Because I, I think people want evidences. I'm part of this group. I belong to this group. I do what this group does. And as we care for one another, I like what you said, Tim, about making it a part of the culture. Uh, that this is this is the expectation. This is this is how this is how it works. Uh, there's no one person that's better than another. The comparisons questions that I have there. Um, and what you were saying about identity, um, I think there are two places identity comes up. One is, what are we sowing for? Uh, sowing for spiritual concerns or physical concerns. Uh, and the other is, I ask the question a bit differently, but, but how do you communicate this, the cross is what matters? That that's where we get our identity. We don't, we're not identified because we do this or don't do this. Paul mentioned circumcision, uncircumcision. We could add a long list of do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. But the identity is ours because we're crucified with Christ. Because we have a new identity in Christ. Uh, and that um, is our faith in him expressing itself uh, in all of that. Well, so many different uh, concepts here that we that we deal with. Um, I'm, I'm going to mention five as uh, I close my part of the study tonight. If I were to summarize either Galatians takeaways or mission takeaways, I would say let us not miss the importance of the pure gospel. It does matter. Uh, the message that's proclaimed. And I think Paul would probably to the contemporary church say, be real careful that you don't find yourself running over into the ditch of legalism. Uh, that, that it doesn't all become a law system without any heart. But I think he would also say, be careful that you don't open the door so widely that anybody and everybody comes in, whether they've repented and changed their life or not. That there is a need to avoid license because liberty empowers love and mutuality and then i just wanted to kind of mention as a final matter all of these verses which are easy to overlook how if we were to do a study of the spirit most of us would not begin in the book of galatians <laughs> uh, most of us would begin in john 14 or uh, some other location where we think a lot of that there are a lot of references, but here are a number of references uh, to the spirit. Once Paul begins describing this gospel of liberty in chapter three, uh, you can see the references in chapter five, uh, extended part chapter five, 16 through 26, and a couple of references today. So uh, there are some takeaways, maybe some mission takeaways to help us think about what should we be saying when we go into the mission field to share the gospel, uh, steer people away from legalism, steer people away from license, empower love and, and mutuality. So Tim, there's uh, some takeaways, some thoughts uh, since uh, we have a, another class coming up here soon and some people trying to do both either here on zoom or on Facebook. And uh, absent any other comments, I'm going to throw it back to you for our closing prayer. 